Good afternoon, I guess good evening. It's getting darker earlier now. Um, my name is Alexandra Stern. I'm the director of LACS, and I'd like to welcome you to this event. Um, we're really pleased that we're able to put on this event and to address and discuss and talk about issues unfolding in Guerrero, Mexico. Um, as you know, this is a story that is unfolding literally minute by minute on the ground. And as a community, we want to understand the gravity and also the horror of what's going on and understand better um, the situation of students who are fighting for economic and social justice in Mexico. So I'm really pleased that we were able to put this together. I'd like to thank Howard and Lenny for all their hard work on this event. And there is power in numbers, so if you can please sign our attendance list, that will help us demonstrate how many people were here at this event. Um, and if you can fill out the survey, that'll also give us good feedback for future events. Um, so with that, I just wanted to welcome you, and I'm going to pass it over to Jason De Leon, who is my colleague in anthropology, who's going to moderate uh, the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you all for for coming. Uh, I will be the, the moderator for this uh, for the presentations, and then for the uh, the, the Q and A that will happen uh, after the fact. I just wanted to say a couple of quick things. Uh, um, so I'm currently housed over in anthropology here on campus, and much of my work focuses on undocumented migration and um, issues related to that, including things like narco violence, um, political violence, uh, and uh, the and, and disappearance. And I just wanted to say a couple of quick things to help us think about what we're going to hear tonight in slightly broader context. Um, uh, when we think about Mexico and violence, this is a this is a um, uh, a common theme that we hear quite a bit about in the media, but oftentimes it's portrayed in really, I think, uh, monolithic sorts of terms. And I think tonight, as we hear from our present presenters, we should be thinking about the global processes that underlie the violence that is happening in Mexico. And the narco violence that we hear so much about in, in the media is intimately tied to U.S. foreign policy. It's intimately tied to economic and conditions, economic conditions in Mexico that are the result oftentimes of U.S. foreign policy. Um, we need to think about things like NAFTA in the context of what we're going to hear about tonight. We need to think about American drug consumption that happens on a daily basis and how that fuels narco violence and uh, narco economies. And we need to think about the role of weapons and firearms in Mexico. Right? They are um, oftentimes coming from, from our backyards. And so these are things to be thinking about um, uh, tonight. But also, I, I just want to point out really quickly, too, that the, uh, the sophistication and violence that has um, uh, arisen with Mexican uh, uh, narco-trafficking over the last three decades didn't happen in a, in a vacuum. We can think about the enforcement practices in southern Florida in the early 1980s that basically shut down the Colombian-Florida connection and forced uh, cartels to go over Mexico. Subsequently, in order for Mexican cartels to be involved in these processes, they had to get more sophisticated and more violent. Island. And so there are all of these things are, um, um, are, are tie us together in these really global ways. And so we should be thinking about the role of, of, of U.S. society, U.S. foreign policy in the context of what we're going to hear people talking about uh, uh, t tonight. And, and finally, I just want to say, too, that we have been brought here together to talk about these missing 43 students, but this is not uh, an anomaly, unfortunately. Right? This has been happening for a very, very long time, and it's unfortunate that um, it takes something like this sort of event to, 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 to raise a, a attention in the in the U.S. media. And so we hope that you will think about things tonight both globally and locally and also be attuned to the, the historical uh, development of these processes and how I, I think in many ways um, those of us here in, in the U.S., especially American citizens, are, I mean, I think a lot of us, are, many people, if not all of us, are implicated in some way in the things that are happening in Mexico. So we, we have to think about these things um, in, uh, in, in a global way and, and, and really be attuned to the c connection between what, what happens in our daily lives and the things that we do and the things that we are seeing uh, currently happening in, in Mexico. That being said, I'm going to introduce both of our speakers in the beginning, and then I will open it up to, um, uh, to then we will, we'll have our first presentation, and then I'll, I'll reintroduce the, the second speaker. Uh, our first speaker tonight is uh, Professor, Professor Jaime uh, Pensado, from, who was born in Mexico City, raised in Los Angeles. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 2008, and that same year began working at uh, the University of Notre Dame. 
Uh, professor Pensado is currently an associate professor of history, the director of the Mexico Writing Group, and a fellow of the Kellogg Institute for International Studies and the Institute for Latino Studies. And this year he was named the director of the Latin American Studies Program at Notre Dame. Uh, Professor Pensado specializes in contemporary Mexican history, student movements, youth culture, and the Cold War. He's currently working on a second book project that examines Catholic youth in Mexico during the post-revolutionary period. And his first book, Rebel Mexico, Student Unrest and Authoritarian Political Culture During the Long 60s, was published in 2013 by Stanford University. Um, his recent publications on student movements can be found in places like uh, The Americas, uh, a quarterly review of uh, inter-American cultural history, um, the uh, Harvard Review of Latin America, um, and in various edited volumes. Uh, his talk tonight, Tlatelolco, 1968, and Ayotzinapa, 2014, a historical comparison of student activism and political violence in Mexico will help um, uh, set the, the, the history behind the, the, the things that we're going to talk tonight and, and, and bring it into a, a contemporary uh, uh, setting. Uh, after Professor Pensado, Pensando's talk, we are going to have um, um, uh, our, our second speaker, Jorge Najera Godinez, uh, who is currently here as a, um, as a visiting um, inter international student. Jorge was born into a Nahuatl uh, community in the northern region of the state of Guerrero, Mexico, known as uh, Chila, Chila Cachapa. Uh, and it was there that Jorge received the first years of his um, primary and secondary education. Because of the lack of quality of schools in his community, he went to the city of Iwala, uh, to continue his training, and we're going to hear more about Iwala tonight. Uh, he then moved to uh, uh, Chilpancingo to pursue a degree in math education at, uh, at, the, uh, at the UNAM in, there in Guerrero, graduating in 2011. Jorge is currently in his third semester of a master's program um, in ma mathematics education at the UNAM there, and he was awarded a scholarship to um, to enroll in classes here at the University of Michigan with the goal of learning new theories of education in addition to uh, furthering uh, the advance of his current thesis. Um, and Jorge, from a quote from here, that he is proud of his past and present indigenous roots. Uh, Guerrero has four ethnic groups that still maintain their native traditions and languages, including Tapaneco, Amutsko, Mixtec, and Nahuatl. Jorge plans to return to his community and teach math. He's passionate about photography, dance, and folk customs of native peoples. He says, quote, surely if I hadn't studied mathematics, I would have liked to study at the Ecole Normale Ayotzinapa because teachers who graduated from this school believed in having a positive influence on the students. This is what made, made them go into teaching. Only through education and, and preserving our culture can we make significant changes in our community. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor uh, Jaime uh, Pensado, who will uh, give us our first presentation. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Jason, for that introduction. And, uh, and it's, I'm, I'm glad to see this many people interested in the events that are taking place in Mexico. Um, but before I, I start with my sort of informal lecture today. I just want to thank Howard, and I want to thank Lenny for inviting me. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I'm trying to make sense of some of the events that are taking place in Mexico, so cope with me. So what I'll do um, as, I, as, as I talk about what happened in Guerrero on September 26 and what is happening today, uh, the social uprising that is happening today, I'll, I'll draw from my own sort of historical knowledge on student activism. So what I'll do is, uh, rather than reading a paper, is just to show you some images that I think highlight <coughs> some interesting parallels, but also some, some obvious differences between the 1960s and, and the events that are taking place today. Um, this picture, for instance, I took when I was in Mexico in 2012, uh, as I was witnessing and as I was trying to make sense of the Yo Soy 132 movement, uh, and I think it really captures very nicely, unfortunately, the, the, the massacre that took place on September 26 in, in, in the state of Guerrero, but also the 43 students uh, who remained disappeared in Mexico. However, what I want to emphasize today is a sense of optimism that I see uh, I've been fascinated by the social uprising that has developed not only in Mexico City, but across the nation and across the world in support of the people in Guerrero, but also um, sort of question and pressure the Mexican state to finally 
transform its system that, so that things like this would not happen again. Uh, just to give you some, some starting images, it's been fascinating to see, for instance, the artistic movements that have developed across the nation to give faces to some of these disappeared people, uh, to sort of tell their stories, to address the pain associated with the families who are still looking for, for, for their, s for their s siblings, daughters, uh, sons rather, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and family members. So the question is why? Why is this happening in Mexico? How do we make sense? As Jason suggested, this is something that, that has been happening in Mexico, but yet we now have a huge social uprising that is uh, trying to make sense of these events in a, different, in a different kind of light. So I think what we need to sort of uh, uh, keep in mind is that there is a very long history of of social movements on the one hand, you know, social mobility, trying to transform particularly the state of Guerrero into a more just society, into a more democratic society, followed by repression, by particularly state repression, and followed by self-defense. This is something that we have been seeing, not just lately in the past month or so, but rather in the last 100 years of Mexico in the state of Guerrero. And uh, just to give you some sort of numbers here, um, you know, the dirty war that happened in Mexico in the 1970s, uh, we now know that there are 400 people who disappeared only in the municipality of Atoyac. There are 81 municipalities in the state of Guerrero. And this gives you just a sense of how violent things were in the 1970s but also how violent things remained in Mexico. On the other hand, in the last weeks or so, uh, people have created these self-defense brigades to s because they don't, trust the, they don't trust the military, they don't trust the government, because oftentimes it is the military uh, that has been involved in many of the atrocities. So in, in 47 out of the 81 municipalities, people have organized these self-defense brigades in the past weeks. Uh, now, also to keep in mind is the, the different sort of violence that has emerged in Mexico in the last few years. Now, you know, we have to sort of talk about the narco presence in the state of Guerrero, but also the different sort of pressures that people feel associated with this new state within the state. Uh, just l this last week, we organized a round table discussion at, at the University of Notre Dame, just sort of trying to make sense of what is going on in Mexico. And we had some, some great colleagues from the Department of Political Science who uh, sort of pointed out to the fact, for instance, that many people in Guerrero are now double taxed. You know, they are taxed by the state, and they are also taxed by this narco state within the state of Guerrero paying as much as 60% of their, of their income tax. And, and as one of my colleagues suggested, this is what people pay in Sweden, right, for their income taxes. But the big difference is that in Sweden you get a lot in return. In the state of Guerrero you don't. Um, now also interesting is the fact that, you know, drug trafficking has been around for a very long time. However, what's different now is that it is the sort of the lines between legal and the illegal are, are, are blurred are, and, and are constantly blurred. So what you have now is uh, uh, people directly associated with the narco trafficking and so on running for elections and winning elections. And this is something that is that was really unheard of in Mexico if you think about the dirty war of the 1970s, for instance. Other numbers that, that, that sort of developed in our conversation is that, you know, during the administration of Felipe Calderón, for instance, we had uh, in Mexico over a thousand sort of civil uprisings, right, of sort of questioning, you know, the, 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 the way in which m Mexico was moving forward. Uh, in the first two years of the administration of Enrique Peña Nieto, we have seen, we have witnessed over 200 uprisings. 50% of these uprisings have taken place since September 26 after the massacre in Guerrero um, and, and so on. Also, you know, pr approximately three and a half million people live in Guerrero, and in the past 20 years or so, over a million 
have migrated to the United States and Canada, escaping, escaping this violence. So these are things that we sort of need to keep in mind. Others, uh, and, and you know, I, was, I wasn't sure if I should sort of show this selfie of, of Felipe Calderon because <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's rather tragic, but I think it also sort of speaks to the dark humor that Mexicans often sort of have to rely on to make sense of, of, of what is going on. But just to give you some, some idea here, right? You know, if you're reading the newspapers today, uh, these numbers keep coming back, right? And this in cited by different institutions, national and international institutions. We know that approximately between 100 and 150,000 have been killed in Mexico in the last eight years. That is huge, right? So that needs to be, that needs to be uh, understood. 20 26,000 people disappeared during the administration of Felipe Calderon. So as Jason was saying, this is not, this is not new, but rather there's a long history uh, uh, here. Uh, 9,000 people have disappeared in the first two years of the administration of Enrique Peña Nieto. 240 people have disappeared only in the state of Guerrero. Over 100,000 people have been kidnapped. Only 2% are, are, are close cases in terms of, you know, the law actually uh, being applied and bring justice to these people. Over 100 journalists have been killed since the year 2000, making Mexico the most or one of the most dangerous uh, countries in the world to, to practice journalism. 98% of these journalists have gone unpunished, or rather the people who killed these journalists have gone unpunished. 669 uh, people uh, associated with human rights activism have been arrested. Many environmentalists in the state of Guerrero. Again, this is only the tip of the iceberg. On the other hand, neoliberal Mexico has produced, you know, many, many uh, billionaires. So m just recently, Mexico ranked 21st in the global list of 40 with the most billionaires. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Slim is, is, is the, the, the richest man in the world. But there are 21 billionaires in Mexico that have benefited tremendously uh, over the last 12 years or so. So again, these are just some numbers that I think allow us to have a better understanding of why, why, why things are developing the way they are. And, um, and also, you know, when I was in Mexico in 2012, but also during conversations that I have uh, last summer as well. You know, you talk to anybody, taxi drivers, you talk to people in the restaurants, you talk to people in the streets, and they tend to emphasize three sort of reactions. One is fear, you know, uh, whereas before, you know, things were happening in Ciudad Juarez, so that was kind of far away from Mexico City. Things are, you know, happening closer to Mexico City. So people that I talk to in Mexico City have expressed a great deal of fear that, you know, this is becoming you know, uh, uh, you know, a national, a national concern. Um, the second, the second people, the second thing people express is a, a, a mistrust of the government, uh, and this is across across social uh, sectors of society. It's interesting, for instance, uh, you know, the the families of the people who disappear, but also people who are participating in the social uprisings. They don't they don't trust the government. Uh, uh, Instead, everyone is waiting to see what the Argentinians are going to say. You know, that forensic team of anthropologists who are sort of trying to make sense of these mass graves that, are, uh, that, that have been discovered in, in Guerrero and so on. They're all waiting to see what the Argentinians are, have to say because they don't trust kind of like the official narrative that develops from the government and so on. And the third expression that people often emphasize is anger particularly among young people. And you know, and it's not clear whether this anger is gonna be channeled towards a, a, a pacifist sort of social uprising or, or a more violent one as we've seen in the past. And I'll come back to those. So th this is something that I think we need to sort of remember. Um, so what I want to do as a sort of as an intellectual exercise is to begin with this picture. Um, who, do we, who do we recognize here? Yeah, so this is Diaz Ordaz morphing with Peña Nieto, right? Uh, uh, so what I want to do today is talk about, you know, Diaz Ordaz, the 1960s, and Peña Nieto's 
sort of a, a latest uh, uh, massacres and, and social uprisings and so on. This is a cartoon by, by Rius, one of, uh, one of uh, Mexico's most prolific political cartoonists. And, um, and, and, and what I want to do specifically is talk about three issues. The state, particularly how civil society made sense of the state in the 1960s, particularly during the, uh, during the student movement of 1968, when there was also a student massacre in the Plaza of Tlatelolco. Uh, you know, how society made sense of the status quo, the police, what the role of the police was in, in the 60s and today, the different kind of mechanisms of control that were used then and now. But I also want to talk about youth as a sort of as a concept, how, you know, it, it differed from the 60s and today. You know, what were the demands of the student movements the options that, that, that students have. And finally, if I have time, and, and Jason, you gotta stop me at one point I, when, I, when I get to my, to my 25 minutes or so, I wanna talk about the national and international responses that have developed um, uh, as a direct result of these, of these student massacres. So in, in terms of the first point, the state now, everyone has probably seen this uh, sort of premature celebration by, uh, on the part of the Time magazine, right, that Mexico's moment had arrived. This was published in November, November 2012, where, you know, it was believed that the Time, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Economist, were celebrating that perhaps the fact that the PRI had returned to power was a good thing. And I remember being in Mexico in 2012, and many people believe that, right? And the idea was that the PRI, who lost power in, uh, for the first time in the year 2000, right, to the uh, conservative opposition from 2012, from 2000 to 2012, uh, had lost control of, of, the, of, of the country. <coughs> and the idea was that the PRI will bring back some stability to Mexico. A lot of people believe that because the PRI, after, after all, knew how to negotiate with, um, with, uh, with the drug trafficking, narcos, and so on. Can you get the light? <laughs> okay. And the idea, again, was that this sort of neoliberal reforms will bring economic development to Mexico, right? But of course, the reality, and I think this is what the social uprising of today has, has pretty much demonstrated is that the Mexican moment never really arrived to Mexico. Uh, rather, it has highlighted that Mexico is far from a country of laws, and, and the discussion that is taking place in social media, but also in newspapers and so on, is, you know, how do we understand the Mexican state? Some have called it a failed state. Some have, have called it a failing state. Others have called it a criminal state. So, you know, this discussion is happening in the newspapers every day. Uh, but as Jason suggested, I think it's, it, is, it is important for us to sort of remind ourselves that this is not a national problem. And I, I completely agree with you, Jason. You know, it's, it's almost impossible to sort of uh, have a better understanding of this without taking into consideration the, the, the Merida Initiative, for instance, implemented in 2008 that, that, you know, that has brought 10 to 15 billion dollars annually to Mexico in the form of arms, in the form of uh, strategic plans to militarize these different parts of, of, of the country. So this is a, not a Mexican problem, but rather an international problem. However, you know, the hope uh, that, uh, that, 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 that Peña Nieto seemed to have represented uh, uh, it's, it's, it's no longer there. And this is a huge difference if we were to sort of compare what happened uh, in, in the 1960s. Uh, a similar sort of hope uh, was talked about in the 1960s. It was not, they were not talking about the Mexican moment, but rather they were talking about the Mexican economic miracle. And it was a real sort of economic growth you know, 6% of the GDP grew from the 1940s to the 1960s, and the international community recognized that. Mexico, of course, became the first underdeveloped country, the first Spanish-speaking country to host the Olympics, right? Mexico had earned that, uh, 
that, uh, that, 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 that I guess that, that role in the international arena. Of course, the student movement that developed partic and that peaked in 1968 sort of highlighted the many people who had been excluded from the Mexican miracle, particularly the children of the working class and so on. And, and, and what we now know, and this is something that I've argued also in my own, in my own work, is that you know, in as far as to make some comparisons of what is going today, I see the movement that is happening today much, much more uh, popular, uh, whereas the movement of 1968 <coughs> was more sort of specifically related to Mexico City and not as popular uh, as perhaps as the leaders uh, have suggested in the literature. What's also very different uh, is that despite the fact that there was a massacre in 68, people, you know, representing different sectors of society in Mexico wrote thousands and thousands of letters to Diaz Ordaz to thank him to f that, that, that he had finally taken care of the revoltosos, the troublemakers. This is after the Tlatelolco massacre, okay? So that is a huge difference. There was huge sectors of society in 1968 that came in support of Diaz Ordaz. That is not necessarily the case today. No one, no one, to my, well, perhaps because I'm a historian now, we don't, we don't have the letters there, but if you, if you pay attention to the newspapers, no one, no one is sort of thanking Enrique Peña Nieto for taking care of the revoltosos in, in, in the state of Guerrero. Now here's another interesting sort of cartoon that I came across with that I think sort of also allows me to speak of how the police uh, has played an important role in, in this violence, right? Uh, and, and what I have argued, el you know, in my own work is that, you know, what happened in Tlatelolco, for instance, in the massacre of Tlatelolco, it should be seen not as a, as a sign of the strength of the, of the state, but rather as a weakness of the state. So, you know, the comparison here that I'm making is that, you know, that, that we have a very similar story here. We have a very, very weak state uh, as, as represented in their, in their police institutions, for instance. You know, they haven't been trained to, to deal with, not repression, but to deal with people, right? And, uh, and that's, that was certainly true in 1968, and it is certainly, certainly true today. Also interesting point of comparison is the use of sort of agent provocateurs known in Mexico as, as porros, you know, who have infiltrated these sort of social uprisings, uh, secret agents and so on, to incite students to become more violent, right? And then this way the, the, the media can speak of, of these movements as violent movements, right? And then the narrative is created that would justify violence against these, uh, these, these students. And this was certainly true in, in the 1950s and 60s, and it is certainly true today. So, you know, as a historian, what I've done is to sort of argue that, you know, students became kind of a national problem in Cold War Mexico in the 1950s, and the state created all these different institutions to, uh, to deal with the so-called student problem. And these agent provocateurs were crucial in Mexico because Mexico, after all, was uh, claiming to be more democratic. It was not like Brazil. It was not like the other sort of future military uh, dictatorships in the southern cone. Mexico had a democracy. So Mexico did not want to use its military forces to deal with the students. And instead, they relied on these sort of uh, semi uh, or rather illegal mechanisms of control. And, and we see this now again, but I think uh, the, the, the movement that is taking place today has been very savvy in the sense of making sure that these infiltrators do not sort of bring a bad name to their movement. And they have taken very specific measures to, to sort of uh, to, to deal away from, from these violent wings sponsored by, 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 by the state in the name of the students and so on. Moving forward here. Uh, you know, the other thing that I see is sort of the criminalization of youth, right? This certainly happened in the 1960s, and it is, this is certainly happening today. However, the difference is that in the 1950s and 60s, sort of the, the, 
the symbol of, of such criminalization of youth was the working class student from the Politecnico. So, you know, this problem, this student problem was talked about uh, as, a, as a class problem. The difference now is that, you know, the, 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 the student from the Escuelas Normales, from Guerrero, for instance, uh, is, a, is a problem that has been racialized. Uh, and I think that is a big difference that, that I hope we can talk about today. Uh, the difference, of course, yeah, you know, the working class students from the Politecnico of the 1950s and 60s eventually moved up the, the social ladder and became part of the middle class. So that was sort of a solution to the social, to the student problem of, of that moment in history. However, you know, in neoliberal Mexico today, these normalistas, these uh, students from the normal schools, seem to have no future. <coughs> Uh, you know, there's, uh, there has been a very long effort to privatize their schools, to convert them into technical schools, to convert them into schools of tourism, for instance. Uh, again, not unique. This uh, happened since the presidency of Diaz Ordaz, who closed 15 of the 29 normal schools. Uh, Osorio Chong, who is now the, the, the Minister of Interior, sort of the Secretary of State of Mexico, uh, during the, the administration of Enrique Peña Nieto, and before that he was the governor of Hidalgo, and, uh, and he has been one of these promoters of sort of getting rid of these escuelas normales with, you know, consequences, right, violating the, the, the autonomy of these universities, but also uh, uh, repressing some of these students in 2000, 2007, 2011. You know, again, this is something that continues to happen uh, and now we have a new governor in, in, in Guerrero, Rogelio Ortega, who we have yet to see. I mean, he has made some promises, but just last, last night he made some announcements that he is cutting uh, 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 fellowships and so on that the students had, had gained since the Mexican Revolution. So, so uh, in that sense, I'm not, I'm not very optimistic. Um, let's see. I have to move on. Um, now, interesting, I think the, the movement that happened in the 1960s and the student movement that is happening today, they're both overwhelmingly moderate. You know, the students of 1968 were calling for respect of the Constitution. Yes, they were carrying all these sort of banners and making references to the Cuban Revolution, to Mao, and so on. But the overwhelming majority of students were moderate, and, and they wanted to transform Mexico into a more democratic Mexico. The same is true of the normalistas. Rather, the emphasis is on social justice and dignity. And um, I've got to move on because I only got one <laughs> minute left. Uh, interesting. Um, there are some promising differences, however. So w what I've seen lately, for instance, is that it's not just the students from the UNAM and the Politecnico who had been at the front of these uprisings, of these social movements. But instead, it has been students from the uh, Esmeralda School. The Esmeralda School was this, the art school that played an important role in 1968 to create those wonderful posters and so on. They were not active for 40 years, and suddenly they came back. Students from the, you know, the, from the Harvards of Mexico, from the MITs of Mexico, you know, are now active. Uh, you know, and, and at the front of this new social movement. Catholic students, conservative students are also demanding a new Mexico, a more democratic Mexico. So, you know, the rhetoric of activism or the, and the tools of activism go beyond sort of this leftist, right rhetoric. And I think, and I think that's, that's great because, you know, it allows different kind of sectors of society to come together and they're all rejecting political parties, including the left, PRD, and of course the left PRD unfortunately also has blood in their hands, right, in the state of Guerrero, and this is what some of the students have also sort of um, uh, um, um, stressed in these last social uprisings. Um, and what students then and now seem to be sort of faced with are two different options. One is a peaceful social movement right, uh, that the, 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 so, so the Zapatistas sort of made famous, right, the emphasis on horizontal power, the emphasis on participatory democracy, and we see a great deal of that taking place in Mexico, the rejection of powerful caudillo leaders and so on. 
uh, pressuring in the international community to become more involved in Mexico, and that's a great thing. And I hope that continues. The other sort of option that we have is, of course, the armed uprisings, right? And this just to give us some background, right? Uh, every time there is a massacre in the state of Guerrero, it has been followed by a guerrilla uprising, right? In 1962, there was a massacre in Iguala that brought or that radicalized Genaro Vasquez and his guerrilla uh, uprising. In 1967, there was a massacre in Atoyac that brought Lucio Cabañas' uh, guerrilla uprising in the 1970s, 60s, and 70s, um, and, and, and that really kind of brought tragic consequences, particularly because of the way in which the state so responded to these guerrilla uprisings throughout the 1970s. And in 1995, there was another massacre uh, that uh, in, in Aguas Blancas that gave rise to the Popular Revolutionary Army. We have yet to see what happens in 2014, but already uh, there's publications of different communiques by various guerrilla organizations, including from many of the popular militias, the self-brigade, self-defense brigades that, that, that I talked about earlier are now, some of them are now talking about a, a, a guerrilla uprising. So, you know, those options are there. Um, let me see. Uh, I think I'm going to, well, I'm just going to say a couple of things here. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, in Mexico, intellectuals who were very uh, vocal in 1968. Elena Poniatowska, for instance, who wrote this wonderful book on, on the student movement of 68. She has been at the fr forefront uh, of, 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 of criticisms lately as well. Uh, here you will see her uh, speaking at the Zócalo in front of hundreds of thousands of people. And she has argued that uh, what is happening in Mexico today is worse than, than what happened in 68. And I completely agree uh, because of some of the things that I, that I, that I talked about today. Uh, other individuals, I don't have time to talk about specific individuals, but I just want to mention uh, just one interesting point. In 1968, the conservative opposition, the PAN, was one of the most outspoken critics of the, of the government in 68. They published journals, newspapers, and, uh, and if you go back to some of their publications, they offer sharp criticisms of the state. The PAN today is it's anachronistic, irrelevant, and it's not really making any claims. But instead, it is society who are making most of the claims. And finally, because I don't have time, I just want to sort of talk about the international media. So, you know, whereas initially, right, there was a great deal of enthusiasm for, you know, Mexico's moment, that is no longer the case. If you read The Economist, if you read The Washington Post, The New Yorkers, The New York Times, and so on, they're all not talking about Mexico's moment, but they're talking about Mexico's uh, uh, mass graves, and they're talking about, you know, this, you know Mexico as, as a terrorist state, question mark, and so on. Uh, and that is, of course, a, a big difference. Uh, you know, just moving forward, this is just a picture of the Zócalo where Poniatowska was talking, just to give you a sense of how big the social movements are getting in Mexico. This, again, is only in Mexico City, but, you know, it's happening all over, all over the nation. And, and, and it is young people who are often at the vanguard of these, of these social movements. And, um, I'll, I'll end here because I don't have time. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Jorge Najera Godinez, who is a native of Guerrero, and um, he's going to tell us what's been happening on the ground and talk about his connection to these 43 missing students. Hello. Thank you for coming to me. It's really important that everybody knows. Hello. Thank you for coming to me. It's really important that everybody knows what is happening in my state, <coughs> especially with the students that most of them are from the, <coughs> are from the same region. 
I would like to <coughs> I would like to to speak in Spanish. I feel a little more comfortable. He's going to make that translation. Can everybody, hear me? Can everybody hear me? Just real quick. Okay. All right. So uh, just FYI, this is how the translation is going to work is that Jorge will be speaking, and I will try to write down as much as I can and translate it uh, to you all as best as I can again. Um, so if there is a moment of pause within the conversation, I do apologize. Just doing the translation in my head. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Bueno, primeramente... <coughs> Quisiera explicarles un poco de quiénes son los estudiantes. He would first like would like to uh, say he would want to see about describing who these students are. Bueno, la escuela normal de rural de Ayotzinapa se caracteriza porque alberga a los estudiantes más pobres de Guerrero. Uno de los requisitos para entrar ahí es de que tienes que ser pobre. Guerrero es el, uno de los estados más pobres dentro de México, junto con Oaxaca y Chiapas. Casualmente son los que tienen el mayor grupo de números, de, el mayor grupo de gr indígenas. The school in which, uh, the normal schools within his region are some of the poorest in the state. And one of the requirements to enter these schools is that you must be of low socioeconomic status. Um, many of these schools uh, have various um, indigenous uh, populations within them. Okay. Bueno, el estado de Guerrero tiene siete regiones. De estas, hay tres que son las más marginadas, que es la región de la montaña, Costa Chica, y la región norte, y parte del centro de donde yo soy. La mayoría de los estudiantes que llegan aquí son hijos de campesinos. No sé si vieron algunas fotos que es, son la región de mi pueblo, que así se visten todavía con trajes típicos, se habla... Todavía el náhuatl, el mixtepoco, el tlapaneco, el amusgo. Most of these students come from three regions uh, who still have a sense of, of very indigenous culture. As indicative of the pictures outside, they speak náhuatl, which is our, some native languages. Um, and these are also some of the most marginalized uh, um, Ge geographically as well as socioeconomically within the state. Bueno, quisiera hablarles un poco sobre lo que pasó en el 2011. Exactamente, dos estudiantes de esta normal fueron asesinados por el gobierno federal, por la policía, donde hay evidencia de fotos donde están los policías disparando y actualmente no hay ningún responsable por ello. El gobierno que acaba de salir culpó a cuatro policías, los metieron a la cárcel como por seis meses y los sacaron y no hay ningún responsable. Entonces, desde, desde nuestra perspectiva como estudiantes críticos, creemos que eso le dio pauta a lo que está pasando ahorita, porque dijeron, no, pues podemos matar a dos, no nos han, no, no nos han hecho nada. Además, son estudiantes pobres, ¿quién va a reclamar por ellos? In 2011, two students from the, from the same normal school were assassinated by police. These police officers were identified, but no justice was served. This set the precedent for the narrative today in which many of the police officers say to themselves that if we are able to do it then, we can do it now. Bueno, nosotros creemos como estudiantes universitarios En Guerrero, parte de la Universidad Autónoma de Guerrero, se unió a este movimiento. Nosotros creemos que detrás de esta masacre hay algo mucho más complejo. Bueno, tiene que ver esto con la reforma educativa. Los únicos que se opusieron rotundamente a la nueva reforma que impuso el gobierno federal fueron los profesores de, de Guerrero. Tenemos, las razones son, este, porque a traves, actualmente a través de un examen quieren evaluarte tu capacidad como profesor pero no están tomando el contexto en donde estamos, donde hay niños que no hablan el español hasta que entran a la secundaria y cómo es posible que a través de un examen que no van a entender, que van a salir mal, te quieran correr. O sea, no están tomando en cuenta a los indígenas. At 
at the University of Guerrero, many of the professors there, they um, don't necessarily support many of the students in that there is a requirement in which you are supposed to be evaluated as far as being a teacher. The only thing is that these professors do not put in context the general area in which these teachers come from and the general population in which they would be teaching. Many of the students that they teach children do not speak Spanish as their first language. They may speak primarily uh, native tongues in their general regions and uh, this is something that is very difficult in which um, many of the, the state itself does not put bilingualism within the context of teaching. Okay. Bueno, entonces como estos profesores, esta escuela normal está entrenando a profesores, pero ellos regresan a las zonas más marginadas que existen en el estado, donde tienen que caminar a veces hasta cinco horas porque no hay, no hay carreteras. Pero la función de estos profesores no solamente es enseñar a leer, a escribir los problemas aritméticos básicos, sino concientizar a esa población a donde las mandan, a ser autosuficientes, a ser productivos, a criticar al gobierno, a, bueno, a pelear por sus derechos. Entonces, de alguna manera, el gobierno no le conviene que estos estudiantes vayan a educar a los, a los estudiantes pobres. Entonces, nosotros creemos que tiene más que ver con por ahí. Many of the teachers studying at these universities have to walk for five hours just to get to their schools. And what's also happening within the, the, these schools is that they are learning to, to fight for their own rights, to voice their opinions against the government, uh, both locally and nationally. And the government does not like to, does not want opposition, basically. And because they, do, they feel that these, these people, um, more because of the marginalized, um, should not have that right above them. Bueno, entonces, el gobierno ha hecho muy bien su trabajo en el aspecto de que ha concientizado a la gente, a la gente que trabaja para el gobierno, de que vea a estos estudiantes como criminales. A estos estudiantes tienen el presupuesto más bajo de todas las universidades de México, yo creo. Comparado con la universidad donde estoy, pues no, no es nada lo que les dan. Esa es la razón por la que ellos tienen que salir a buscar dinero a diferentes ciudades. Siempre lo han hecho. El objetivo de hacer esto es para que los estudiantes que están ya en el último año vayan a hacer sus prácticas docentes, que son, muchas veces tienen que viajar en autobús ocho horas, posteriormente caminar y llegar ahí y donde no hay nada que comer. Entonces, esa es la razón por la que juntan dinero. Este, se apoyan mucho ellos. Entonces, este, eso fue lo que pasó que estaban haciendo. Okay, by the way, that's some pictures from Guerrero. That's the Iwala municipality. Okay, sorry about that. So the state is doing their job in making these students look like criminals. What many times happens is that these students must because of uh, their general area in which they come from uh, being very poor as well, they do not receive a lot of funding for their studies. So they must travel outside to uh, local areas and other cities, many times traveling for eight hours and not having anything to eat when they arrive there and trying to ask for money to be able to continue their studies. Um, so what happens is that these students, many times they rally together and support each other. Uh, 
during this the, during these times, and and it's much more important uh, as well to try and push for students who are within their last year, last terms, to uh, finish um, so they can continue on. Okay. Bueno, para los estudiantes que llegan acá es la única opción que tienen para salir adelante. La otra opción es venirse a trabajar de ilegales a Estados Unidos. La otra es trabajar para el narco. O sea, esas son las únicas opciones que tienen. Y la que toman, los toman como criminales. ¿eh? So these students mainly have two options, to either finish their studies and be able to work within their, uh, their own general areas or to work for the narco cartels. Or immigrate over here and work. Or, or come over here as illegals and, uh, and work the fields. Este, Guerrero actualmente, su población es de 6 millones, de los cuales 3 millones están trabajando acá. 3 millones estamos. Ya. Yeah. La ciudad más poblada de Guerrero es Acapulco. Después de la ciudad más poblada, es una ciudad de acá. <laughs> Chicago tiene la población más grande de guerrerenses. Six million. So there's, there are um, approximately six million uh, people within the city of Guerrero. Three million of them, of them are actually located here in the United States. Acapulco is one of the largest uh, cities within the state that actually houses many of these people. The other other city is Chicago. Bueno, la normal prepara estudiantes bilingües, cosa que actualmente el gobierno mexicano no no se está importando por la gente indígena. ¿Qué es lo que está pasando ahorita con todos los acuerdos que ha hecho el gobierno? Para, para nos, ser indígena en México significa que no eres nadie. ¿Por qué? Porque para el capitalismo, para el neoliberalismo, los indígenas no consumen, los indígenas no producen, por lo tanto son imprescindibles. Entonces, lo que están tratando de hacer es acabar con los indígenas, porque donde vivimos tenemos muchas riquezas, tanto ecológicas como hay muchas minas. Y lo que están tratando de hacer es, creemos que es mucho más complejo de lo que pasó actualmente con lo que pasó en Iguala. Es algo que se, da, se ha dado desde hace mucho, muchos años, pero eso como que es la punta del iceberg, de lo que pasa no solo en Guerrero, pasa en todos los estados, creemos. The normal schools, um, the normal school actually prepares bilingual uh, teachers, something that the government does not do readily. They feel that because of their capitalistic views in which indigenous people do not buy nor consume, th uh, that this type of, that they must do away with the this indigenous type of culture. We are, we, we have much resources, many uh, minerals and other agricultural in which, and just a different way of looking at what is valuable to us. What happened in Iwala also happens in many other places throughout Mexico and, not, and speci specifically with it throughout Guerrero. Bueno, bueno actualmente creemos que, que el gobierno está montando todo un teatro porque hubo unas declaraciones del padre Solaldine, que es una persona muy respetada y no creo que esté mintiendo, donde él declaró que en secreto de confesión, unas personas que asesinaron a los estudiantes, le confesaron que los habían matado y que los habían quemado algunos vivos. Entonces, el gobierno actualmente está ganando tiempo para ver qué teatro montar y decir y justificar los hechos tan evidentes que ha pasado ahí, 
actualmente está tratando de incriminar a los normalistas, diciendo que ahí venían unos grupos rivales de los guerreros unidos, cosa que es totalmente falso. We think that the government is pain, painting a, a large picture and doing a big act. Famous priest said that he has heard the confessions of two police officers who has who have committed the acts. But in the same sense, the, the government is creating scapegoats and different narratives uh, against the students and uh, trying to blame others, other people other than those within their own context and networks. Well, no. Actualmente el movimiento que está surgiendo en Guerrero, sobre todo, cosa que para muchos es sorprendente, las atrocidades que se cometen día a día en nuestro, en nuestro estado. En mi comunidad, todo lo que está pasando esto, pasó hace como en el 2010, donde familias enteras fueron desaparecidas, donde el, el control de los que nos gobernaban estaban corrompidos con el narco. Si tú querías alzar la voz, solamente llegaban por ti y te llevaban y jamás supiste nada. Muchos de los cuerpos que están ahí son cerca de mi comunidad. O sea, no me sorprendería que fueran de las personas que vivían a mi, ahí con nosotros. Many within the movement are not necessarily too surprised about the actions, but they are continuously surprised about the atrocities that happened. These happens, happen day by day. And very similar acts in which ma uh, large groups of people are missing have happened also in 2011, where whole families have disappeared. Many of the bodies have were found within his, the same community in which Jorge lives. The narrative of raise your voice, you may disappear is growing. Bueno, actualmente sí, me creo que las redes sociales desempeñaron un papel muy importante para que es este hecho que fue un hecho local que en un principio el mismo gobernador del estado trataron de tapar se hizo tan grande que que no pensaron en todas las implicaciones que se metía no solo el Estado de Guerrero, el gobierno federal y toda la presión que está haciendo el mundo entero y sobre todo los estudiantes, cosa que era muy difícil ver que una escuela privada como la Ibero, que donde van hijos de puros ricos, se, sola, se solidarizara con, con hijos de campesinos. O sea, es que esto ya no, ya no podemos permitir que pase, porque tal vez hoy Hoy fueron ellos, mañana podremos ser nosotros. This movement has very has surprised the, gun, the governor extremely, as many other universities, both within the, the state and the nation, have so come together over this topic. Universities in which are more prestigious and more higher in socioeconomic status, um, he cannot fathom how those students can join sons and daughters of farm workers and this type of movement. But it is that the narrative of it is them today, it might be us tomorrow, and this type of actions must stop is something that is continuously happening. Actualmente la sociedad se está preguntando, ¿qué cosecha un país que siembra estudiantes?
society is asking, what type of place is this that can both, and I'm going to be very, I'm trying to <laughs> get these words right, both uh, take away and as well as uh, take away students. Um, the word that I want to use, it might be uh, wrong, but how can put it in for you? Harvest. Harvest. Thank you. For the harvest these students. Okay. Well, if you have any question, please. Uh, it is really hard to me try to talk about my my friends. So thank you for coming. So maybe. I don't have enough words to express myself in English. I just arrived here two months, ago, two months ago, but I'm planning to come back to study my PhD. But I want to come back to my community in order to work with my people, because it's the only way that we can do a change through education. It is really important to me to be here and know a lot of people who can help me to do this. And thank you so much for your help. Open it up to questions and uh, comments. I don't think there's a. I mean, you can. You guys don't need a mic, but just speak loudly, please. If you, um, if you'd like to have a, uh, if you have a comment or a question for our panelists. Okay. Um. Hola. Muchas gracias por um. Por eso, por favor, muchas gracias. Y um, la pregunta que yo quiero hacer es, ¿qué nosotros como estudiantes aquí en la universidad podemos hacer para ayudar en este tipo de movimiento? Mira, la mayoría de las, de las mamás que están ahí son señoras que muchas no saben ni leer ni escribir. Ellas están durmiendo esperando a sus hijos. Llevan 35 días esperándolos. Hay mucha gente que se ha solidarizado Cuando pasó este evento, yo traté de buscar a gente, pero para ser honestos, pues el llegar aquí a una cultura nueva, una lengua nueva, se me hacía como un poco difícil encontrar gente. Afortunadamente, encontré mucho apoyo. A mí me gustaría hacer, por ejemplo, una colecta de víveres, lo que sea. Es lo que están haciendo todas las universidades de México y de acá, de Estados Unidos y de Europa. Y pues, no sé, enviarle. Creamos una un website en Guerrero donde estamos tomando fotos. Yo creo que eso es una manera, al menos, para ver que hay mucho apoyo a nivel internacional. Entonces, es lo que me gustaría hacer. Él trajo un póster, tomar unas fotos y mandarlas a la página para que vean que University of Michigan está solidarizándose con ellos. Does anybody need translation to me ask right now? <laughs> yes, the coach? Okay. Um, so what he he said is that uh, many of the mothers and fathers um, are, have uh, gone more than 35 days without any type of answers. And many of these uh, individuals do, don't necessarily know how to write um, or, or some don't even speak Spanish. So what is happening within this move, movement is that uh, many are sending pictures of the ca different campaigns oh, that are happening throughout uh, different universities and just uh, <coughs> different aspects. Um, he mentioned that we have created a poster here so that if later on, this is an example of what to do, of later on you would like to take some pictures, sign, um, there is a larger campaign on, the, on a website on Facebook happening that just ties everything together and for the most part it helps the families of the uh, missing 43 uh, know that they have support uh, both within uh, either within Mexico as well as internationally on this type of issue. He just he also said that he um, they, a lot of universities and a lot of places are collecting money and goods to send to the families in Guerrero because they are from really really poor families and very, very basic needs are in some cases not being met. Um, it also cut back all the support that the 
just normal students would usually get, and so getting collect collections together in universities is a helpful way. Yeah, and first of all, my question was, in case people didn't understand, was what as we, um, us as students, can do to kind of help the situation that's occurring now um, in Guerrero. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for all the intervention and explanation. I think it's a really hard topic to, to work in. Uh, I'm from Mexico, too, and I'm not from Guerrero, but I'm from, well, all my family is from Oaxaca, that is also an indigenous community in, in Mexico. And uh, there, is, there are so many ways to support these people. Uh, uh, what we are trying to do, what we are trying to organize is that the next November 5th, uh, there is going to happen the second day of global action for Ayotzinapa. And the people uh, in Mexico uh, uh, is asking to the people in all the world to help them. And the, some of the, of the things that we could do here is to call the Mexican consulate in Detroit and ask them what's going on in Mexico and to tell them that we are really aware about all, uh, all these 43 uh, students disappeared, uh, that we are uh, hoping that the government will be responsible for their actions and that we also ask for justice. That's one of the actions. Other of the actions that we uh, propose is to call uh, well, the U.S. citizens, please call the, your ambassador in Mexico and please tell him that the United States has to establish a, a position about what's going on in Mexico, not only about the 43 students. As uh, Jaime said, this is only the tip of the iceberg because, well, there, there, are, the, there are these 43 students disappeared, but sadly, uh, disappearance in Mexico is something really common. Uh, now we are talking about 150 people murdered and about uh, more than 30,000 30, people disappeared in Mexico, but th th there are different numbers. The, some people say that there are 30,000. There are so, some other people that say that are around 80,000. Uh, some organization that works with migrants, for example, they say that just only migrants from 2005 to 2012 are about uh, 70,000 uh, people, migrants disappeared just in Mexico in these years. So what we can say about this, if we don't have the numbers, is that the state is not doing its work because we don't know, we don't have the date, we don't have the numbers, we don't have any uh, information. And the situation is really critical. I'm a journalist in Mexico and we have suffered, well, many of my friends have been disappeared and many of my friends have been killed. And um, well, I also work with migrants, with Padre Alejandro Solalinde that was in the pictures. And uh, we need like uh, international support. Uh, we create a Facebook page for the event on Wednesday that it's called uh, uh, Michigan Global Action for Ayotzinapa just for this Wednesday, but maybe we could use to create another web to help Ayotzinapa and to help people. As Jorge said, all the students have suffering uh, criminalization, uh, but there, there have been suffering so many things. Uh, for example, uh, uh, two weeks later of the disappearance of the students, the government tried to give 100,000 uh, pesos to the parents of these students just to uh, shut up. Yeah. Yes, and for example, they are also, as uh, Jorge said, the uh, school is not receiving any more uh, money. The government stopped giving resources to the to the students, and the, these resources are not uh, big. Are not big resources. For as Jaime says, uh, the students receive a uh, thousand pesos from the Guerrero government and seventy hundred pesos. 700 pesos, sorry, f f by uh, by the Mexican government at the end are less than $200 per month. And for example, another kind of thing is that the, the criminalization, they are saying that the students were part of the uh, of the of, uh, drug cartel and that's why they clash because there were opposite organizations about well uh, what i and also they uh, with the reforms with the 2000 
13 reforms, the educational reform, they tried to close uh, Ayotzinapa. Ayotzinapa was one of the main, uh, the, this reform focused on Ayotzinapa because people have said that Ayotzinapa is the cradle, the cradle of guerrilleros and uh, in the law that was tried to be passed the, the last year, that says exclusively that they want to close Ayotzinapa. And the professors of Oaxaca and the professors of Guerrero were the ones who stopped this reform. They made a campaign that lasted some months. At, actually, the, 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 camp, the camp start the last year, and now if you go to Mexico City and if you go to the Monumento a la Revolución, the, the, the professors are still there. The professors are still there fighting for their rights, um, but thanks to them, the Ayotzinapa school continues going on. So, well, there, there are so many things to do. You can send, uh, well, ha as Jorge said, you can raise some money to send the families, but also um, uh, you can call the Mexican consulate in Detroit, you can call your ambassador, and you can invite people all around the United States to make the same to the consulate, to the near Mexican consulate, or to call the U.S. ambassador in Mexico. We, I'm going to just pass out. We have some quarter sheets that have the number of the U.S. consulate in Detroit. Um, I don't have enough for everybody. I'm so sorry. But it will also be on the Facebook page, and maybe if you can share, um, we'll send them around. Can I? Yeah? Oh, great. People can take pictures. Send them around. Someone here? Oh. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marta Valadez. I'm an organizer. Um, I um, work with the immigrant community here in Washtenaw County. And um, my question is, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what's going on there, and I'm kind of curious to hear sort of your kind of prediction. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but um, your presentation was great, and I was really curious about what your um, predictions are and what sort of predictions in terms of the increase in, um, and this probably would be for Jason also, um, increase in immigration. Um, uh, what predictions do you have in terms of the implications of the violence that's happening that is predicted to come, that could come um, in terms of the student's reaction, in terms of um, fear of more families? You know, Do you think this is a kind of climatic moment in our history and sort of um, this discussion around what role does the U.S. play in the, um, this uh, sort of type of um, support or intervention that could they could play um, around this issue that's happening right now currently. So kind of if maybe you two could respond, that would be great. Thank you. Well, no, I should begin by saying that I am a historian. Please uh, speak into the mic. It's for the, the recording. Try to stay away from any predictions, but um, but I would say, however, that that I am very optimistic, as I as I said, and mainly because um, the young people that are participating in Mexico, making this a huge social uprising, are doing it in a way that is very different. Uh, you know, they're you know they're emphasizing, as I said, this sort of participatory democracy. They're emphasizing horizontal uh, organizations. Uh, they're not seeking for leaders, they're not seeking for specific political parties, but in fact they're rejecting these political parties, and I see that as a healthy thing. Um, and, and they seem to be uh, using social media in a very effective way that it's allowing uh, Mexico to be at the center of discussion, as what we see here today, but also, you know, in Europe. The European Union has put a lot of pressure on on the Mexican government to, to do something about this. And the only way, the only reason why the Mexican government is doing anything is because it's receiving international pressure. Um, and I think that, that is what needs to continue to happen. You say, because of that, there's a lot of media, international media, especially in the Escuela de Ayotzinapa, waiting to, for news, but because of them, uh, like everybody is sharing the, the the interviews that they did, because the local media they they don't care about what is happening with our own people. So that's really sad, because the media is working for the governor, is working for the president, and if they are going to show up something on the TV, is something when where the students 
are acting violent. That's the only, that's the only way that they can show up something on the TV. I guess also to add to my question is uh, also why do you think that um, there is such, uh, I mean, just with the advancements in technology, like where we are in our history in terms of being able to mobilize people and take action, there's such a huge immigrant rights movement here in this area. What, why the disconnect and how could that be improved to strengthen solidarity work that's happening in, uh, with the student movement um, and the parents um, in, uh, in Mexico? Like everybody is saying in Mexico, if if you are against Ayotzinapa, you are against to the human being, because you have to support them in any way that you can do. That's fine. I think with pictures, if you can send like he already said, call to the local council. I don't know. I don't know. But because of the media, I think the the power of the media is has because of that we are doing this. Because if we didn't do that, and because I think we are a new generation that everybody use Facebook technology or social media, I think because of that, we, we, we know what is happening now in Mexico. Because if not, maybe nobody will, will be able to know what happened with these students. I'll just say one, one thing to follow up on that. Um, the, you know, the role of the media plays in all of this. I don't know about you guys, but it felt like three months ago we were being overrun by Central American children. I haven't heard much about that anymore. Right? That was sort of in vogue for a little bit, and then um, you know the, the the politics of visibility um, come into play, and we made we've pretty much made them um, incredibly invisible once again. Um, that being a direct response, U S. Uh, border enforcement and the, and the federal government saying it's actually pretty unsightly to see children running into South through South Texas. I don't want to see it anymore. Let's put economic and political pressure on the Mexican government. Let's let's you know plan sur. We did this in the in in the in the uh, in the late 90s, early 2000. Let's push the U.S.-Mexico border down to Guatemala. Let's try to slow down this um, this migration of people because it's politically unpopular. We're getting ready to we're getting ready to vote, right? So we got to figure out ways to 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 deflect to distract. And with this, with, with what's going on right now, I think you know the important thing is to is to keep it in keep it visible, you know, and try to find ways to um, have a longer life history than what we typically, you know, the American public has a very short memory, and the media is a really the media and politicians do a pretty good job of um, of bringing things in and out of focus. And so I think this stuff's not going to go away, right? We're not economically developing Chiapas, Oaxaca, uh, Guerrero. Um, when we said five years ago that immigration had stopped, you know, some very problematic uh, declarations made by U.S. Um, um, analysts, you know, they weren't standing at the borders looking at all the Central Americans, the people coming from the West and, and Southern Mexico who were still coming across. Um, but the way that was spun by play, things like the New York Times, you know, all of a sudden now, oh, immigration's at zero, let's, uh, let's think about something else. Uh, so I think with, with what's going on with the student movement now, it's, it, it, in order to sustain itself, I think there has to be um, this global um, push to keep the stuff in, in, in the media and so that it doesn't it doesn't become a kind of new um, it doesn't become the, the, the thing of the hour and then, and then go away again which um, we, we continuously are seeing happen so I think you know these sort of grassroots movements are important but they have to be sustained and one of the you know my issues with with college campuses is that we're always looking for some new um, some new thing to get behind and then we forget you know I mean these 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 political movements sometimes are come into vogue and then they go away and so I think we need to be more committed to to think what's going on in Mexico and not um, have this be the, f the flavor of the week because obviously it's been going on for for quite a long time in Mexico and we're only now starting to really pay attention to it which is surprising I mean, right, we're, we're nation building in other places and we don't seem to be caring too much about what's happening to our southern neighbors for various reasons that I won't get into uh. and I just so everybody knows there's various uh, universities throughout Latin America and even uh, what uh, in Europe that actually have took up this cause. So it's very important just to continue on with the narrative that is happening. Um, like um, Jason has said that um, you need to continuously just be getting informed about what the updates will be on this. Putting the U.S. media aside, um, Last week, the Pulitzer Prize-winning Mexican journalist uh, Alberto Cortado was here, Corchado, and he was speaking to our class um, about reporting in Mexico. His 
life has been threatened numerous times. Please speak um, the I'm sorry, we can't hear you. So, I just wanted to say a word in their defense. It's not as simple as the media in Mexico was simply not covering it. Um, according to the description of his daily job in Mexico, it was, and you had the slide about, it's one of the most dangerous countries on earth for journalists right now. So, I just didn't want that comment to go, and you know, that it's sort of by laziness or choice or it's a little more complex than that, I think, the situation for journalists on the ground there, Mexican journalists. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with the independent newspaper, Sin Embargo, uh, that's, that's, you know, really covering the things that are happening in Mexico. And, and what the state or people in positions of power are doing is they're sort of launching a sort of a... Uh, an internet war with Sin Embargo. They're hacking their their system. They're sort of telling all these lies about the journalists who write for Sin Embargo. So there's you know there's a lot of uh, provocation that is that is associated with with this war against independent media. So it's 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 not only dangerous but it's it's difficult. It's difficult. But this is why it's important to sort of support this independent media that has achieved a sense of legitimacy, right? The challenge, of course, is also to sort of be uh, con uh, uh, convinced by everything that you read, because not everything is true. Josek, would I add something? Uh, when, when the student had the first attack, there was like around two hours difference between the first and the second. So at the first attack, was one student were killed, was killed. So they were looking for help. They were looking for the local media, and the local media tell them, we can go over there because the, the governor and the president municipal said that we can, we can cover the news. So they wait two hours while the police were trying to kill the student. So they have two hours to do the job. And they were looking for help, the only, the only who attend the help was the Radio Universidad Autónoma de Guerrero, but the local media and the radios didn't want to cover that because that local media is working for the president municipal, but the president municipal is working with the cartels. So the cartels control the local media there. Another question about kind of like news consumers in Mexico. Um, I, had a, I just was wondering about like news consumers in Mexico and if people are, if, if, news readers and people who watch like um, televised news and things like are they s really skeptical at this point I mean are they super skeptical of like what they read I mean how much trust is there in the media and like what what's being reported I, mean, I think it's hard to answer that question but you know what I see different in Mexico now is that people are not believing the official narrative okay. and I think that's a great thing that was not the true, that was not the case in, in the 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, it was easier to control the media because, you know, the, 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 the state, for instance, in Mexico had a monopoly on paper, okay. right? So, so there, it was easier to control what the journalists were writing about. Mm -hmm. But now, because of, of social media, it's, 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 it's more difficult. Okay. So now, you know, televised news has to negotiate, right? Okay. Uh, so people are very concerned or very wary of, of what they're actually watching. Okay. I would like to add something. That's true, but I feel like the Moide University, the student, we don't believe in Televisa and TV Azteca. Okay. But they still have a lot of power with unadulterated people. And that's why the government don't like that. Teachers go over there to, to educate the right. poor people. So I think they still have a lot of power. They're established. Even, even right. in, my, in my city, mm -hmm. they were happy because of what happened to the students. Can you believe? So they were so happy because they say they were looking for that. Yeah. That they sometimes they are watching just novellas. They don't want to read like the Sin Embargo newspaper. There are another like in media, like they are doing the, the job. So they go to Televisa, watch that news, and that's still have a lot of power. And we are trying to break that one out. We need like more media, independent media in Mexico in order to, to, to have more critical thinker mm -hmm. persons. That's the same here, right? I mean, if you're getting your news from CNN. And oh, yeah. And Fox yeah. News, sorry, MSNBC. 
you're only getting right, this much. Right, right, no analysis, or, right, yeah. Okay, thanks. I think we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much to the speakers and moderator, and feel free to stay and talk. I mean, this doesn't have to end. We can stay informally and continue the discussion.